Hello, it's Scott Manley here, following up with my Kepler planet discovery video. So last week we talked about how the Kepler spacecraft can find all these planets around various stars by a, watching their eclipses, or rather watching their transits around the parent. Well, the reason the Kepler spacecraft is back in the news is because of the announcement of Kepler 452, a planet which has been described as Earth's twin. And that is actually really stretching the definition a little, and we'll go into that later. Now, the reason why we call it Kepler 452b, that's actually a little complicated. Basically, the Kepler 452 indicates that the star previously didn't have an interesting name, so the Kepler team decided to call it 452 because it was a 450 second star that they decided was interesting enough to actually give a number to. The B indicates that it is a first planet, and that is a lowercase b. Now, with binary systems, where you have multiple star systems, the stars are labeled you know, A, B, and C, but these are uppercase letters. So, for example, Sirius has a component Sirius A, uppercase A, Sirius B, uppercase B. But if there was a planet around Sirius A, it would become Sirius uppercase A, lowercase b and that is just like starts to get very complicated and then there's also the case where you have two stars that are orbiting very close to each other in a pair right you could have a planet further out that you might discover so that would be called star name uppercase a uppercase b uh, lowercase b okay naming systems are something that are designed to give order to things the iau are actually starting to consider exploring, accepting the possibility of maybe accepting real reasonable names of these planets. But that will probably take another 10 years of wrangling before we get really cool names like Caprica or whatever. Anyway, Kepler 452b. Uh, it orbits the star, which is very similar to the sun. Now, the star is only a few percent heavier than the sun, which means because it's heavier, it means it's brighter. But the star is also about a billion years older. The sun is about five billion years. The star is about six billion years old. So the star has been evolving a little longer. And it turns out the main sequence stars, as they get older, they tend to get brighter. So this star is about 10% brighter than the sun. Okay, but we're still pretty close. Now, this Kepler 452b, it is orbiting at uh, a distance that puts it smack bang in the middle of the habitable zone, right? So that's why it's interesting. It's roughly, relatively speaking, based upon the amount of sun it's getting, it's roughly at the same distance to its parent as our Earth is to our sun. So it's getting roughly the same amount of light per square meter as the, the Earth would. So that's one of the things that makes it a twin. It is, however, about 60% wider, 60% larger than the Earth. Now, if you remember, Kepler can only detect the shadow of this planet moving in front of the sun. So it comes around and it goes, oh, I can't see it, actually, except the thing's really, really tiny. So it's like a you know, fragment of dust moving around my head here. Um, so because of that, you can't actually tell very much about the planet. All you can tell is how much it blocked the sun. Now, you presume that it's not actually passing any light through it, because that would really be complicated. But... Um, that tells you, based upon how much, it's how much it's blocking, how big the planet is. So 60% larger. It doesn't tell you what it's made of. It could be made of super lightweight rocks. It could be made of solid iron. It could be some sort of gas thing. It could be something with an extended atmosphere. We simply can't tell from the limited amount of data we have. But assuming that it's similar to the Earth, well, you imagine a solid surface. So 60% wider radius or 60% greater diameter translates to about two and a half times the surface area and more importantly about four times the volume which means that you're talking about four to five times the mass. Surface gravity will be significantly higher than the Earth and getting into orbit would require um, more than twice the delta V. So while this is similar to the Earth in terms of the amount of sun, in terms of uh, being, you know, possibly in the right region, it is a lot heavier. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have the same type of Earth. 
So we can't really tell the status of this planet. We don't know the composition, we don't know the atmosphere, we don't know if it has a magnetic field. We It could be a Venus-like planet with a thick atmosphere that just traps all the heat and keeps the planet incredibly warm. It could similarly be something like Mars, which has lost all its water and is therefore now a giant desert planet. And, you know, that's quite, both of those situations are rather viable. If you have a larger planet, it's very likely that it is vol more volcanically active and therefore spewing more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere so you could have a runaway greenhouse effect. This is one theory. Uh, another side of this is that because the star has been around longer, the planet has been evolving longer, it could have lost... Uh, it's water to space, uh, and then therefore ended up like a desert. Actually, I'm saying that um, Venus has also lost all its water to space. So, yeah, all sorts of possibilities there. It's almost, I mean, if you were to put a bet on it, I would say it's probably not going to be like Earth. But then again, we've been known to be wrong. So to really actually figure out whether this planet could sustain life, much a lot of follow-up work has to be done. And this kind of follow-up work would involve watching the planet as it passes in front of the star and trying to get more information on its atmosphere and how it changes the light. You see, as it passes in front of the star, maybe we start to see the telltale signatures in the light of uh, water or carbon dioxide or all sorts of things which would indicate that the planet has an atmosphere. Or we might see nothing indicating that it's barren, but... Truthfully, we probably won't see anything detectable because it will be so far below our, our instrument capabilities at this time. We'd need bigger instruments to perhaps really get a handle on this. That's one of the downsides of this eclipsing system in that uh, doing the follow-up, finding them is easy, doing the follow-up takes a long time. I mean, we knew about Venus we knew about Venus since antiquity, but right up until the 1960s, people were writing about Venus as if it would be a lush jungle world instead of a hell hole with a temperature that would melt lead. You know, and, and that was like right on our doorstep. <laughs> anyway, uh, Kepler-452, incidentally, I pointed out that if life did evolve there, because the planet is so much heavier and more massive... It's questionable as to whether they would actually really have a space program because they would have to they would have to work a lot harder to get into orbit. Um, if you remember, I did my video about what we did to launch the New Horizons spacecraft, where we took the Atlas V and we strapped on as many rockets as possible that we could, or many boosters as we could, and then on top of that, we put an extra Star Forty Eight kicker, and that put a three hundred kilogram spacecraft on a an, on a trajectory straight out of the solar system and flying by Pluto. Well, uh, you would get used that whole thing, and then you would just barely get into orbit. So. You know, Earth, we're kind of lucky that the Earth's gravity is perhaps just at the right level that it's strong enough to hold on to the Earth's atmosphere and we have a strong enough uh, magnetic field to keep, you know, our atmosphere here and protect us. But we're also light enough that we can still launch spacecraft into space. It's entirely possible that there are civilizations out there which have evolved life, but they are stuck on the surface of the planet simply because taking that first step out into space is so far beyond their imagining that it never happens. And maybe uh, we'll, in fact, one day meet a race like that. Who knows? Kepler 452b is 1,400 light years away. We're not going to be going there anytime soon. In fact, whether we ever go there is, well, definitely open to question. But um, it's definitely would be an interesting place for us to check out and continue to study from afar. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.